That was a very, very powerful worship session. Um, I know we, I think we should thank him again. That was brilliant. <laughs> Praise God. Actually, let's give him a louder cheer, because I reckon it was better than that. Was, <laughs> glory to God. This is how I fight my battle. That's a cool song. You know, that is so true. Worship is a weapon. Worship is warfare. And uh, you guys carry that beautifully. Uh, You've got weapons up there on stage. And did you know that each and every one of you is a, a worship weapon? You don't need to be on stage to be a worship leader. Did you know that? You're born to be a worship leader. Uh, Whether it's in church or at home, wherever you are, everything we do is worship under the Lord. Amen? Amen. Whether we sing or play an instrument or not, God loves your worship and your affection and your delight that we offer up to Him. It's a beautiful thing. So, uh, man, this is really exciting. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. And uh, my better half is going to be here tomorrow morning, Chelsea, as Matt mentioned. And uh, she has a very strong prophetic gift and uh, prophetic anointing. And I'm so sure you guys are going to be blessed. I, if, you're not, if you hadn't planned on being here tomorrow morning, I, I would encourage you strongly to change your plans and be here tomorrow morning. I think it's probably going to be the most powerful session out of all of them. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not just saying that because she's my wife. She's a powerhouse. So you're really going to enjoy that tomorrow morning. So she is at home with our f- Three younger, beautiful children. I've got four children, uh, and they're all beautiful children. Uh, my oldest son, Reese, is 20, and I don't think he's home, and he's not being looked after by his mum tonight. Uh, he's doing his own thing, and but he's a great, a great young man. And we've got three younger children, Esther, Caleb, and Abigail. It's Caleb's birthday today, and so uh, he has turned seven. Esther is eight almost turning nine, and Abigail is just turned uh, five, and she's just started school, so all of our kids are in uh, school now as well, and family's beautiful, I love it. Uh, I was at a a minister's network meeting the other day, and they all laughed at me, they thought it was quite funny that I get away with having crazy dreadlocks and wild hair like this, and still get to speak behind the the pulpit, but I found a scripture for my hair, <laughs> all right, just in case anyone's a little bit worried, you ready? It's in uh, Jeremiah twenty eleven. I can't believe I found this, it was so awesome. It says, Jeremiah twenty eleven. it says, but the Lord is with me like a dread champion. <laughs> yes! So that's my uh, license to keep growing it a little bit longer, all right, so praise God. And Samson, that's right. The strength. I can't cut it. I've got to keep, keep it growing. So glory to God. All right. So, uh, yeah, I just feel to touch on the worship side of things a little more. Um, it's a big passion of mine, worship. And we are, in terms of our identity and this being ide- an identity conference, we need to understand that we are worshipers, first and foremost. Everything we do is, whether it's ministry, whether it's business, no matter what you do, it needs to flow out of relationship with God. Our relationships with one another uh, flow best when we're flowing with God and when we have a deep, rich relationship with God. And worship is certainly one of the best ways to develop that and establish a deep, rich relationship with God. But it's also a weapon, and I think some of you need to get a hold of that. The Bible says, let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. To me, that's a picture of warfare. Praise is powerful. Worship is warfare. Worship is a weapon. So when we praise God, demons flee. Did you know that? I'll say that again. When we praise God, demons flee. It's not Christian karaoke. It's not just a side thing or just some sort of lead-up event to the main event, it's very, very, very powerful. And I want to encourage every one of us to engage in worship and not just go through the motions. Amen? It's very powerful. It's spiritual warfare. What's happening in the spirit 
although we can't see it in the natural, then you would be shocked at what's happening in the spirit, particularly when hearts are engaged with God. For the hour, the Bible says, the hour has come when the Father is looking for those that will worship in spirit and in truth. And when you know who you are, you can't help but worship in spirit and in truth. When you know that you're loved, when you know that you're beloved, the beloved, when you know that you're a son, when you, when you know that you're a daughter, when you know that you have a clean slate, when your sins have been washed away, when you know that you've been translated out of darkness and into His glorious light, you can't help but want to shout because Jesus is King. And it's not hype, but it's passion because God has breathed His precious life in you. The same Spirit, when you get a revelation that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives and abides in each one of us. When you get the revelation that the Acts 1-8 dunamis miracle working power that was talked about by Jesus Himself, that very same Acts 1-8 power, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When you get that revelation that that Spirit doesn't come and go. That anointing doesn't come and go, that, that anointing abides. When you start to understand these things, you can't help but be passionate and worship. And just, you want to get on your knees and you just want to shout and you want to just give everything that you can. You know, the Bible says, love your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, everything that we have. And I want to encourage each and every one of us. Some people, we're, we're all different personalities and some of us are more introvert, extrovert, quiet, loud. But when it comes to worship, worshiping God, I want to encourage you to just don't put yourself in a box or categorize yourself. Just let yourself be free when it comes to adoration and expression for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? You know, it's in Psalms it says, let all the earth, Make a loud noise, a loud, joyful noise unto God. That means each and every one of us. Amen? Um, by the way, thanks, Pastor Matt, Anna. You guys are amazing pastors, amazing leaders. You guys have got an amazing church. This is my second time, I think, here now. And uh, I really appreciate, I love being here. Um, you, you opened by, in Psalms 24, I think you talked about how we're gates. And uh, that scripture, again, at the end of Psalms 24, it says, Let the King of glory in, who is the King of glory, the Lord mighty in battle. When you understand that you're a gate, and, that, and when you open up your heart in worship under God, when you understand that you're an ancient, everlasting door, and you open your heart up, you open the gate up, you allow the King of glory to flow through you, in you, and it's the very King of glory that fights on your behalf. This is how I fight my battles, because He flows through us. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I think it's verse 21, it's Jehoshaphat's army, who remembers that famous story? It's good to remind ourselves, that's one of my favorites, it said that they sent the worship is out on the front line. Worshippers of frontline missionaries. And they went out and began to sing and began to praise and began to, in fact, specifically praise God for the beauty of His holiness. It said that God set an ambush. They were surrounded, the people of God, the Israelites, were surrounded by enemies, left, right, and center. They were outnumbered. But this is how I fight my battles. And they began to praise God for the beauty of His holiness. I believe partly because they believed the prophetic word that was spoken over them. They believed who they were. When you believe God in the context of who you are, in the context of that you're blessed, in the context that He wants the best for you, you can't help but be in a place of faith where you worship, even in the midst of your enemies. 
because this is how we fight our battles. We believe God and we show Him that we believe Him by praising Him, by adoring Him, by worshipping Him. The enemy wants to lie to you and tell you that you're hopeless and tell you that you're not worthy. You're still a sinner. You're still messed up. You're fearful. fearful. You're afraid. No, you're introvert. Don't go to that meeting tonight. You've heard it all before. All of these garbage lies, these fiery darts of the enemy to try and get you into a place where you hibernate, where you go back into your shell, where you even stop praising and adoring and worshiping God. But I want to encourage you, we've got to push through that. We've got to fight through that. We've got to take up that two-edged sword. Let the high praises of God be in our mouth. Amen. And we punch through those lies. We punch through those atmospheres that try to stop us from moving forward as a church, as a congregation, but not only that, in our marriages, in our families, in our personal life. When you get breakthrough in this area of praise and worship in your own life, not just in church meetings, but everywhere, it flows through like a river into every area of your life. I promise. I promise. It's coming from someone that hasn't just learnt this in a theological Bible college, although I'm not against that. I like study, I love scriptures, I love teaching. But I'm telling you this from a point of view, or from the context of me being very broken before I was salvation, uh, before I was saved. Messed up on drugs, full of devils, full of demons. Our band was uh, very successful playing in nightclubs. We'd signed this record deal and everything that went with it, the sex, drugs, the rock and roll, spot, my life was spiraling out of control. Messed up, so messed up towards the end, just before Jesus intervened, that the doctors said that I was a paranoid schizophrenic. So messed up. I was full of devils and full of demons. But I walked in, praised by the grace of God I should be in hell, but I walked into a meeting just like this. It reminded me of this space. And when I was worshiping here tonight and just looking around and watching everyone worship, it reminded me of that meeting that I stepped into as this messed up, broken person that did not even deserve an inch of God's grace and mercy. But this church, they'd created this space where God could inhabit the praises of His people. So I stepped into this space and I encountered God and in one moment I was delivered of devils and drug addiction and all this craziness, man. And I want to tell you it's because of the presence, because of the Word of God and I learned to establish a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of praise. And that helped me grow in God. So I was delivered, but then I wanted to grow in God. I wanted to grow in my destiny. I wanted to grow in the knowledge of who I was in Christ. So I want to encourage you. It wasn't part of my notes and a part of my sermon, but I felt very strong. I think because I was inspired by the worship set. And on this house, I believe, You have a very strong anointing when it comes to praise and worship. And I've been around a lot of churches around the world, and there's something very special in this house. So I want to encourage you, don't just leave it to the musicians. But, you know, the best churches are those where it's not the band leading the congregation, it's the congregation leading the band. You know, there's moments where it just breaks out. It makes it really easy for the worship leader, doesn't it? But that will happen when you when we continue to develop a lifestyle of praise and worship in our home, in our car, everywhere we are. And then when we get to these meetings, we're already overflowing, we're buzzing, and it's just wild and powerful. But I believe there's going to be an increase. It's already amazing, but I believe there's going to be an increase in that area. So keep stewarding that and keep hungering for that because I reckon God's going to begin to crash through particularly through praise and worship like you've never seen it before in Manningham. So I say yes to Jesus. All right, so uh, 
as Matt mentioned before, I'm stepping into a new role, and in fact, have stepped into a new role. My wife has stepped into a new role, so she's now the senior leader of our main campus in Seaford, in Frankston. And so I have now stepped into a role as the associate director for a ministry called Awakening Australia. Has anyone heard of Awakening Australia? Praise God. Have you? Maybe some of you have heard of Awakening Europe. There's been some extraordinary things that God's been doing in Europe. By the way, uh, Pastor Phil and Pastor Debbie are campus leaders for us over in the Gippsland campus, all the way out in Bunyip in Warrigal. And so uh, you know that you've got a You've got good pastors when they travel two and a bit hours, yeah. even though they're busy with their own thing. They, they, they're so hungry, yeah. you know, and it's, it's hunger that attracts favor and the presence of God. And uh, so, hey, it's good to have you guys here. Praise God. All right. So I want to show you a little clip, a little highlight clip, just to inspire you about what's happening in our nation. All right. So if we can show that now, that'd be awesome. There's a wave that's about to crash over this nation, amen? So uh, I want to thank you guys for supporting it, for backing it. Uh, there's a couple of things uh, that I'd really like to make note of, and we're encouraging people from all around the world. This is not associated with any particular denomination or any particular church. The idea of Awakening Australia is that we would support local churches. So we want to see the masses saved, the multitude saved, and we want to see Manningham full of people that have been saved as a result of being at that event. But it's up to us to invite our family and our friends. So I'd encourage you to uh, register. Uh, we've made it super cheap. It's a three-day event with some amazing speakers. Um, it's interesting that we've had so much support and no one, we haven't even hardly mentioned who's speaking, which is so good because ultimately it's about Jesus. Amen. Although there are some amazing speakers. You can check out the website. You'll be blown away and some bands, and it goes over three days, and we're going to see tens of thousands of people saved. We're going to see tens, at least 10,000 people are going to go out onto the street during the days with armed with free tickets, praying for the sick, preaching the gospel, and bringing people in for the night rally. Then we're going to throw the net out at night and see a great harvest of souls. Amen? So um, some of the things that we're asking people, so if you would like to be involved, obviously it would be awesome if you can come, bring your family and friends. Let's see your family and friends get saved. Uh, by the way, don't wait until November. You might as well start now and bring them to church now, amen? <laughs> uh, and then they can bring their family. By the time it gets to November, they can bring their family and friends. So, uh, But we start now, and in fact, our mandate is 100,000 souls in 2018. That's a nas uh, national target. Uh, all denominations, all of God's people working together. So it's not just Pentecostal, it's Baptists, it's Charismatic Catholics, it's anyone that loves Jesus. It's, uh, we unite around uh, Jesus and we put our differences aside for the sake of seeing the lost souls one to Him. Amen? So uh, we'd encourage you to be a part of that now. Be a part of winning souls. And uh, let's see if we can... We, we believe that that... Uh, figure of 100,000 was given to us by heaven, that if we pray and believe and get activated in who we are in Christ and step out and begin to reach out to our family and friends and people in our workplace and schools, I think we can do it. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Glory to God. All right, so uh, that's a part of our mandate. Uh, and 
just quickly, and I think this it ties in with this identity conference. So I'll just I'll read it out. We're also um, we've begun a nation, nationwide prayer movement. And it's something really simple, but uh, I was actually having dinner with Matt before and at 7 o'clock my phone alarm went off and my phone alarm at 7 o'clock comes up on my screen that it's time to pray for our nation. So that's something that we can all do. We'd encourage you to do that. Get your phone, set your alarm as an ongoing alarm at 7 p.m. No matter what happens, we pray for our nation at 7 o'clock. We've got thousands already that have committed to it around the nation and i uh, Lots of intercessions beginning to go up because nothing, we can book the stadium and we can have all this great marketing plan and rah, 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 but without prayer, we're not going to see God move. Amen? We need prayer. So we'd encourage you, set your phone for 7 p.m. Uh, we're going after breaking the fear of man, and I can't wait to get into that during this conference. A big part of uh, knowing who we are in Christ is knowing that we're bold. And the righteous are as bold as a lion. And we're going to begin to unpack that over the next, over the coming days. And we love seeing the fear of man broken off Christians. Because once the fear of man's broken, then anything can happen. Because you no longer care about the opinions of man. And all you care about is the voice of God. And you yield your will to the, the will of God. And that's when miracles break out. And that gets exciting when, when the fear of man breaks off. So who's ready uh, to go to even greater levels of freedom. And for some of you, you might already be bold, but you know there's even more levels of boldness that you can begin to tap into and walk in. You can walk, there's a fullness that's available to you. And the definition of God's fullness is overflowing. Amen? So there's no cap when it comes to God's definition for full, and He wants you to be so free. The Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen? And the other area that we're encouraging people in the lead up to the summit, if you like, or the main event, is encouraging every believer to engage in lifestyle discipleship. So we're not just, you know, we don't just want to see people go to an event, but from here to there and onwards, we want to begin to grow in not just relying on the pastor to disciple, but each and every one of us, as a lifestyle, begin to disciple someone. We have someone on our prayer list, we have a friend, we take him out to coffee, we take him to Bible study, we invite them to church and we sit next to them and we encourage them and we disciple them. And uh, that's what we want to see, not just the masses saved, but people discipled as well. Amen? Glory to God. So, uh, awakeningaustralia.org, and you can check all that out. You can register there, bring your family and friends. But let's get into the Word. You ready? Yeah. We're going to start in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you'll, this first session is titled, Who You Are and Who You Can Be. So why don't you say to the person next to you, Who are you and who can you be? I like that. You're talking to your hand. That's, that's cool. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> All right. Colossians 20, uh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 21. I'm going to read a part of verse 21, and then we're going to go, we're going to jump back to verse 19 and read through to verse 23. So if you guys are cool, I love the word. You guys cool with a bit of word tonight? We're going to actually, we're going to read the scriptures. Man, I love the word. As I said before, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that changed my life. I was delivered of demons. I was set free. I was healed in my body, in my mind, in my soul in that one encounter, in that one moment. But after that, it was the hours of reading of Scripture that caused my mind to be renewed. And that's when I really began to be transformed in understanding who I was in Christ. I personally love to actually encourage people to read their Bibles and read their scriptures, whether it's on Sunday, in conferences, wherever it is, because it's, if I tell you something and you believe it, that's cool, but someone else might come along and tell you something that is opposite, and then you begin to believe them, and you kind of just flow with every wind of doctrine. But if you see it for yourself in the Bible, something supernatural happens, I believe, when you read it when you see God's Word for yourself, 
it renews your mind, it brings transformation, and the Bible says it's the truth that sets us free. They shall know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. Amen? So I want to encourage us, let's be hungry and inspired to read the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures. Let's read our Bibles. Amen? So Colossians 1, verse, chapter 1, verse 21, and you, everyone say you. So the Apostle Paul is writing to the Colossian church, and it's to the church, so it's, the context is to Christians, okay? So he's saying, and so we can apply this to us. How many people are Christians here? I like to do this. Um, I have a big part of me as an evangelist, so I have two motives here. I do want to know who's Christian, but I also want to know who's not, just in case. <laughs> because you're in the right place if you're not. And you're also in the right place if you are. Amen? Church is always the right place. So who's a Christian? Awesome. Okay. This is an identity conference. I did suspect most of us will be Christian because we're learning who we are in Christ. Amen? If you're not in Christ yet, I would encourage you to get born again, and then you can begin to learn who you are in Christ. Amen? So the context here is to Christians, is to people who are already born again. And the Apostle Paul says this, he says, And you, who once were alienated and enemies. Everyone say alienated and enemies. Now you'll notice that, the, that Paul there has uh, written, you once were. So we're looking at past tense, right? To know who you are in Christ is important, but I believe to really understand and unpack the full de definition of knowing who you are, it's also important to know who you were before you were saved. For me, it helps me appreciate who I am now because I don't forget how messed up I was. On the way here, I was singing that song, Amazing Grace. And even though it's a song I've sang hundreds, probably thousands of times, it never grows old. Uh, and it talks about the amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was a wretch. Notice how I say I was a wretch. I don't categorize myself as a wretch anymore. The enemy still tries to call me a wretch sometimes. But I've decided to remind him of his future and his present state too. He's a loser. And he's a liar. In fact, the Bible says that he's the father of lies. He's the author of lies. God didn't create lies. The, the, Satan did. And he lies to us to try and bring us down, to try and tell us that we're wretched, that we're still alienated, and that we're actually enemies, and you're no good, and why would God love you, and all of this garbage that he tries to sow and throw in our minds. So Paul is talking about our past tense here as believers. He says, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Everyone say reconciled. reconciled. We're going we're to learn what it looks like to be reconciled unto God over the coming days. That word reconciled is very, very, very important. So I want you to highlight that, and now we're going to skip back to verse 19. So we know we were alienated, we were enemies, but now we are reconciled. Now we're going to skip back to verse 19, and it says, For it pleased the Father. Everyone say pleased. pleased. We're alienated, we were enemies. And yet here we see it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. Everyone say fullness. And by Him to reconcile all things to Himself by Him. Everyone say all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Jesus had to go to the cross to reconcile us back to Him. This is very, very important when it comes to the foundation of identity. 
way back in the beginning in the book of Genesis, you read about the fall of man. The famous story of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve were made and formed. They were in relationship with one another, in relationship with God. Everything was wonderful. They could do whatever they wanted. They had dominion. They named the fish and the animals. And and it was a beautiful thing. I believe they weren't meant to die. They had eternal life there in the Garden of Eden. They were full of life. Their soul was abounding in God. Their flesh was alive. There was no disease, no sickness, no death. Their spirit was connected with God. They were sons and a son and daughter to God. But God said, do whatever you want, but don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it will kill you. But we know the story. The enemy was able to get in and deceive. Deception came. Adam and Eve fell. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin entered mankind. But it's interesting that they didn't die there and then on the spot. Or did they? If you look at the history, you can... In the biblical text, you find out that Adam and Eve, they lived for quite some time. They didn't die right there when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, their flesh didn't die. Their heart still kept ticking, their fleshly heart, but their spiritual heart died right there on the spot. They were spiritually disconnected by God Right there and then. And humankind from there on was uh, disconnected from God spiritually. And God needed a plan to reconcile man back to him. To be in relationship again with him. Are you with me? plan was Jesus. That's why he fought so hard to protect the Israelites, because he knew that it was the Jewish bloodline that was going to usher in the Messiah that was going to save mankind and reconcile mankind. In Romans, it says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Yeah? All of us were partakers of that sin. We all deserved death. As a result of the fall of mankind, we all inherited a sinful nature. Everyone say sinful nature. We were all alienated. We were all enemies. That was our old nature. But I want to show you something tonight, and I'm going to reveal it more towards the end of the message, that you are now no longer a sinner. You now are no longer an enemy. You now are no longer separated from God something very powerful, something very special happened. And we need to know the fullness of this. We need to fully understand who we are now from Scripture. Amen? So that we can live out a transformed life. Are you with me? All right, so back to verse 19. Let's let's try that again. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy 
and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Full stop there. Because of the blood that was shed. Now the wages of sin is death. We were all deserving of death, but Jesus stood in the gap on our behalf and died in our place. His perfect holy blood was shed for the remission of sin. And when we, get, when we got born again, when we received that free gift of salvation, He breathed His life into us again. And He gave us His holiness and His righteousness so that He can now present us blameless. Man, I, I've preached this a few times. I've read it about a thousand plus times. But I just, I, every time I read it, something happens on the inside of me. Every time I think about it, I get stirred up in my faith, knowing that I am holy because He is holy knowing that I have been made righteous, not by my own works. That's like filthy rags, the Bible says. But by what He has done on the cross. I'm not in and out of righteousness. I'm not in and out of holiness. To be honest, I can't get any more holy than what He has made me. Sometimes my actions may not show that. Just ask my wife tomorrow morning. (laughs) But that doesn't change the fact that on the inside, who I am, the real me, I'm holy. I'm righteous because of the blood of Jesus. And you need to believe that. If you don't believe it, you won't see it. But if you'll believe it, you'll begin to live it out. As he is, so am I. As he is, so are we. Jesus was perfect. Amen? Even in the flesh, he was perfect. The Bible says he was tempted in every way. The enemy came to him, tempted him, but he resisted the temptation. Do you know you have the ability to live the same way as Jesus did, if you'll believe. You'll be tempted just like Him. But there's an ability in you to live out holiness. There's an ability in you. There's a grace. There's a power that God has given you to resist the temptation of the enemy. To say no to the deeds of the flesh. The wickedness of this world, the God of this world that tries to blindfold the eyes of the unbeliever. Grace is not a license to continue in sin. It is unmerited favor, but it's also a powerful force that lives and abides in each of us. The Bible says it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. That's why we call out the gold in one another. There's gold in each and every one of us. You might be having a bad day, a bad week. Your soul might be all messed up. And you may even be going through a season where you're believing lies. But that doesn't change who you are. That's external stuff trying to veer you off track. And that's why we need one another. That's why we need community. That's why I'm so grateful to God that you have a precious community here in Manningham. Stick together. Believe together. Fight the good fight of faith together. Call out the gold in one another. When someone's feeling down and depressed and believing lies about themselves, speak the truth of who God says they are. They're beautifully and wonderfully made. That's what the Bible says. 
You're righteous. You're holy. You may have sinned. You may have messed up. You may have looked at pornography. The Bible says we have an advocate. And the blood of Jesus washes us clean if we'll repent and say, God, forgive me. I don't want to live like that. Help me live out who I really am. That's not who I am. I don't lust. I don't cheat. I'm not a drunkard. I'm not an addict. I don't gossip. I believe the best about people. It's who I am. I'm not believing the lies of the enemy anymore. Amen? But we do need each other. That's why family is so important. We encourage each other. Don't pull each other down. Build each other up. Amen? The gifts of the Spirit. Paul teaches about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. Teaches the church about the beautiful gifts of the Spirit. We need it. But you'll notice, if you, I won't go through it now, but if you do a study in your own time, it repeats on numerous occasions the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit. It's to build up and to edify the believer. Everyone say build up, edify. So the gift of prophecy, by the way, every one of us here has access to the gift of prophecy. You might not be called to the office of prophet, but you can all prophesy. Because Jesus is in you and he's the spirit of prophecy. But when we prophesy, we call out the gold. Amen? You don't need a gift to find fault in one another. We can all see our flaws, right? We're, we all have bad days. But we need the eyes of God to see the gold. To call out the gold in one another. To encourage one another. To build one another up. To remind each other of who we really are in Christ. Because while we're on this earth, it's a battle. We've got got our own humanity to deal with. We've got forces in the unseen realm that are opposing us all the time. In heaven it won't be like that. Praise God. But while we're on this earth, especially if you're going to get active in praying, active in reaching out and winning souls in your community, Believing for revival, expect there to be backlash in the spirit. Expect the enemy to, to be get up to get upset. But even when he gets upset, let that inspire you to know that you're going the right way. When things come against you, let it inspire you to say, Oh, this is gonna be a great opportunity to show people around me that God is more powerful than these current circumstances that try to oppose me. Amen. We can't lose as Christians, man. That's why we're going to get so passionate. That's why we're so passionate when we worship and praise Him. Because we can't lose. Even if we were martyred, we get promoted to headquarters. We can't lose. Amen? This is how I fight my battles. Glory to God. All right, let's get back into the Bible. This time we're going to go to Romans chapter 5. Verse 10, very similar, this reinforces what we've just heard. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We weren't, there is an analogy and it's correct and I use it in terms of um, in our previous life before being saved, really we were like in a, a prison of sin. Who's heard that analogy before? And it's true, we're, we're bound by the God of this world. We're in chains, chains of sin and Things of this world just hold us down and and we're caged in and some of us don't even realize it. But Jesus comes to open up the prison door and to let us out. And that analogy is a good analogy, it's correct, but I want to take it a step further. It wasn't just some prison guard opening the door, but it was your father that came 
and paid the bail because he loves you so dearly. He did everything that he could to, to pay the price, the ultimate price, to lead you out of that prison. And he doesn't see you as a criminal anymore. He sees you as a son. That's what we need to understand. You're not a criminal anymore. In fact, the Bible says that as far as east is to the west, he's removed your transgressions, not only removed them, it says that he can't even remember. If God's forgotten, why do you keep reminding yourself? I know the enemy will try to remind us. God's forgotten your transgression. Not only is it gone, he's forgotten it. Because you've repented and you've given your life to him and he's washed you clean. Amen? So it's not a prison guard opening the door. It's your father who loves you dearly, paid the ultimate price, the bail, so to speak, to get you out and to have you back in relationship with him. Amen? That's who you are. You're a son and you're a daughter. All right. I want to take us now to, I'm going to begin to sort of start winding up and concluding, and then I'll really want to get to my main point tonight. So I'm going to jump to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. And I'm also going to be reading 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Two opposite scriptures in terms of who we are and who we were. You ready? First of all, we're going to start with Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. Everyone say, we all once. We don't do that now. That's our past life. It's not what we do now, amen? Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, we were, everyone say were, were. by nature children of wrath just as others. The term sinful nature, who said that as a Christian? You would have heard it over the years. And sometimes... Rightly or wrongly, you decide after reading this. Um, we even as Christians have taken on the label and claimed upon ourselves that we are, or that we have a sinful nature. And I remember in the early days, I, I believed that. I thought that I had a ticket to heaven and I was grateful that I was going to heaven and that Jesus had saved me, but I still thought I had a sinful nature. But when I begin to study out who I really was, and begin to read these scriptures, I realize, hang on, that's past tense. It says that I and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. It doesn't say that I am now. It says I were. That's really important. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. The righteous shall live by faith. We live out righteousness because we believe that we're righteous. Let's now look at 2 Peter 1.4. Man, when I got a hold of this, I remember in the early days struggling still with lust and different types of deeds of the flesh, like it was a fight. And I'm like, man, why am I still struggling in these areas? I thought I was a Christian. And then I realized it's because I still believed that I had this sinful nature. And I was told that I still had, it's okay, you're just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not just a sinner anymore. He saved me from sin and made me someone brand new. 2 Peter 1.4, this is this really got me. I hope this gets you. Some of you might already know this, but it's great to hear it again. Amen? It's great to hear it again. Lord, renew our minds that we would be live out this transformed life. 2 Peter 1.4, by which have been given to us 
So this is present tense now. This is for us as believers, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Who wants some of that? That through these you might or you may be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped. Who's escaped? Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's not a future. That's not a promise for the future. It's, this is talking to Christians now. Amen? This is your promise now. When you, when you became born again, God gave you His divine nature. You were literally translated supernaturally. It's the greatest miracle of all. I love, the, I love it when deaf ears pop open and the dead raisings. and the, I love it all. But there's no greater miracle than, the, than a, a, a sin-touched heart being born again. And this is what happens. It says that we get translated out of darkness into His light. But not only that, He breathes His life into us. And we become, when we get born again, we become partakers of His divine nature. His divine nature is not sinful. That sinful nature is removed. And you become someone brand new. It's no longer I that live. If you need any more scripture, I'll give you more. (laughs) It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. I'm a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. The old sinful nature has passed away. Behold, I'm now a partaker of His divine nature. And that's when it gets exciting. So if you, I wanted to lay that foundation tonight for the opening night because you need to get that. You need to believe that. And once you believe it, then you start to think, well, what is the divine nature? What's the fullness of the divine nature? How, how do we unpack what this divine nature is? And I tell you, it's a treasure chest from heaven. And once you open it up, man, there is so much treasure that's inside of you, so much gold that's inside of you. you it'll blow your mind and your mind will continue to be blown and blown away year after year after year after year. God's love is unending and His unending love's inside of you. Yeah, this is so powerful. And some stuff is taught and some stuff is caught. Sometimes I just like to kind of pause and just meditate or, you know, salah, like it says in in the Psalms, and just meditate, just think about that for a minute. If you believe it, if the pennies dropped, so to speak, you believe that you're not a sin- sinner anymore, saved by grace. You're not, you don't have a sinful nature. It's the past. You're a partaker of His divine nature. What does that look like? What is this power that abides in you? Who are you now that you're a new creation? What does that mean? If you believe it, that's when you see it activated. If you don't know it or you don't believe it, it lays dormant. I remember I went into Myanmar in some of the villages where they hadn't hadn't seen an iPad. And I was thinking... And if I handed this iPad to one of these people in the villages, they, they might think, oh, thanks. They might use it as a Frisbee or, and have no idea of the potential that is in their hands. I mean, they have no idea that they can connect to different people from around the world in one moment. They could even call someone in the United States, the other side of the world, through Skype or through uh, Messenger on Facebook, or they could 
pay bills, they could access all types of resources that they didn't even know existed if they had knowledge in terms of the potential of this iPad. I mean, I don't even understand the full potential of this yet. I just know how to do a few things. Get people to help me with that stuff. But do you understand where I'm going with that? In the same way as Christians, we have this glorious power in us. We, we are a new creature. We are righteous. We are holy. We're partakers of His divine nature. But some of us don't know it yet. And others have plateaued. And others have allowed their hunger to kind of wade. And others have settled like the analogy of the Israelites and how they were called to the promised land, but some settled along the way. God wants to continue to reveal His glory to you. God wants to continue to reveal His precious promises to you. And I believe that some of us, whether it's taught or caught in the next two to three days, are going to be so overwhelmed you're going to fall even more in love with God, more in love with Jesus. And as you behold Him, you're going to be, begin to understand His love for you. And as you behold Him, you're going to begin to understand who you are in Christ and how He thinks about you. And it's amazing. Amen? Praise God. Well, I can't wait to unpack even more what that divine nature looks like over the coming days. Let me just give you one clue for you to meditate on tonight, maybe as you go home. The Bible says that Jesus is the express image of God the Father. What does that mean? Um, when we see the life of Jesus, and we can see it in the Gospels and in the New Testament, we actually see the Father the nature of the Father. It's like Bill Johnson says, it's perfect theology when we study Jesus because He is God. Amen? And so that same Jesus lives in you. That same Jesus inspires you to live like Him and says you can do it. He even said, see these things that I do, you'll be able to do greater. Inspires you to take it a step further like a good father would to his son, to his daughter. In every way. In every way. We're going to learn about this divine nature that abides in us. And we're going to be activated. Once we learn who we are, it's a lot easier to see who others are. If you don't know who you are, it's pretty hard to call the gold out in someone else. Amen? So you're going to learn who you are and then we're going to be activated and encouraging one another, building one another up, and calling out the gold and recognizing the God in each and every one of us. Amen? And it's fun, man. I can't wait to see what happens. So, <laughs> Praise God. I'd, I'd love to pray for a few people tonight, if that's okay. I love teaching, and I think teaching is, I, I love it all. I love the impartation. I love the worship. Teaching is very important. We need the Word. We can't just have the Spirit and not the Word. And we can't just have the Word and not the Spirit. We need it all. Right. Amen. And I also love impartation. The Bible talks about the laying on of hands and impartation. And something very, very powerful can happen through that time. So I would love to, if anyone wants prayer in regards to maybe you, want your, you feel like your hunger has waned a little bit or you even feel like you've settled and you feel like you want that fanning into flame, that's what these conferences are awesome for. We're creating space, like what uh, Pastor Matt said. It's an extended time that we're giving to God, we're making that sacrifice. So I'm giving you my Friday night, giving you my Saturday, giving you my Sunday because I want to open up my heart even more. God, I want you to breathe your life into me. I want to fan into flame that first love fire. I want to know who I am. God, open up my mind. Lord, I want my mind to be totally renewed in this area of identity so that I can live out this transformed life and be a blessing 
to others around me. Amen? All right, praise God. So I might hand it back, Pastor Matt, and then I'd love to pray for some people for, uh, tonight as well. So praise God. Fantastic. Come on, let's give Dan a... So just, just before we invite you forward for prayer, um, uh, I think it'd just be really fitting for us to take up a love offering for not only Dan, but Chelsea as well. And uh, we're going to be get doing this again tomorrow, uh, late tomorrow afternoon, um, to give people who haven't had an opportunity yet. And you may not have come prepared tonight, and that's okay. Um, 